Just close our eyes for a second and we ask the Holy Spirit to enkindle our hearts with love and warmth, desire to awaken into this moment where Jesus said when two or more gathered in his name, the name of love, that he is present, that we are members of this body, this one body of Christ, this one body of the universal Christ. And we ask that you bless this conversation, this dialogue, as we speak about how to embody our anchored self using the tools and wisdom of the Enneagram. And we ask that you bless us so that we can use it to bless others and to do good in the world. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six folks, that's good. The first slide, as you can see, is I just have the, the three combinations. The three big things that we've talked about uh, are three, not the three, but three of the big things that we have talked about. And I actually made them the back slide or the uh, background of the slides to come. And it's this idea that all three of these things, when you look at them, they all about going down and in that the spiritual path um, to, to embrace and recognize the universal Christ within us, as well as being in the flow of the universal Christ in our life, is a pathway that is downward. Um, instead of, you know, the mo most of us think about is we got to pray and go up, up, God is up. And I'm not saying that's a bad way to look at it, but I think that the pathway up, if you will, is actually to go down and in more deeply. So on the left side, we have the pathway from the old room into liminal space and into the new room. In the middle, we have the pathway of the floating self down and in into the anchored self. And then on the right side, uh, we have the pathway of the we could, this is an iceberg, and we could call this the top part that's above the water. We could say that that is the conscious level, and then the pathway is down into the unconscious to understand and learn more about the unconscious. All three of these things are in some ways saying the same thing, just packaged up in, in different images. Okay? Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Enneagram. And this is something that you guys have invited me to talk about. You seem to show some interest in that. Um, <clears throat> and I, I want to relate it to the universal Christ really quickly because the universal Christ is this understanding that God is a plurality, that this notion of reality, which we call God, capital R, reality, is, is one, God is one, but this one is manyness. Um, that all of the plurality, the diversity of things that we experience in the universe are all contained together in a larger force field, almost, if you can see it that way, uh, of love. And that unity or oneness is not uniformity, that we're all the same, everything is the same, because otherwise there'd be no experience. White light can't experience itself, it has to have diversity. Rather, unity is diversity maintained and balanced by love. That's what unity is. Unity is diversity maintained and balanced by love. And so what um, I would like to say is that the Enneagram is a wisdom tradition 
that can help us understand the diverse natures of how people make sense of reality. You could think of it this way. Reality is so difficult to understand. It's so massively large that we have to have strategies, angles to come in, ways to start somewhere. And <clears throat> as we start somewhere, the more that we learn about our own strategy of life, we go down in the anchored self, and then we start to be able to see we can have all aspects, positive aspects of all of the different types on the Enneagram, all right? But what we, um, we're gonna start by saying that the Enneagram could be seen as the nine faces of Christ that we could, we could think of Christ as being all nine of these equally, uh, and then you and I would have all of them inside us, but we will be making an art form of one of them. Okay, so we're gonna return to that. But just to quickly go over the Enneagram, Enea or Enea, means nine in Greek. Gram means shape. So Enneagram is the shape of nine, uh, what we're calling the nine faces of Christ, Christ being the circle itself, the whole. And uh, <clears throat> the nine types are, um, the, the type one is the reformer, type two is the helper, Type three is the achiever. Type four is the individualist. Type five is the investigator. Six, the loyalist. Type seven is the enthusiast. Type eight is the challenger. And type nine is the peacemaker. Okay? And uh, we're going to go into... Um, right now three distinct centers three distinct centers that these types fall into <clears throat> and, and notice that there's this is a, a kind of a trinity if you will all right we have each center is made up of three and there's three centers you see very triune the eights, nines, and ones make up what's called the instinctive center. These are like gut reactions. Um, and the eights, nines, and ones are people who make up immediate first impressions. And they're very good about sizing up a situation and instinctively acting or processing something immediately, okay? Um, <clears throat> the problem is, is that they often don't know how to become detached from their first impressions because maybe their first impressions are wrong. And they also happen to be, I think, the most stubborn of all the types, <laughs> hardest to, to change in a way. But uh, each center will have their gift and their shadow. You'll see that a lot, is each center, each type has its light and its darkness, its vice and virtue, its, its um, places of shadow and places of clarity. The feeling center is going to be the twos, threes, and fours. And the twos, threes, and fours, they process reality first and foremost through their feelings. Um, <clears throat> the problem there is that it's usually not their feelings that they're feeling, however. They think it is. Uh, the feelings that the twos, threes, and fours are often feeling are the feelings they think others are feeling. So they're busy, they're getting busy thinking about all these other feelings and sometimes they're right. Sometimes, you know, two, threes, and fours can be kind of mind readers um, or feeling heart readers maybe, huh? But uh, have a sense of what others are feeling and then they lose track of what they actually are feeling deep down inside you know, or they mistake that. 
um, the five, sixes, and sevens are the thinking center, the thinking center. And these people process the world first and foremost through the idea, the realm of ideas or philosophies, theologies, uh, ways to understand the world is almost kind of like a, an outline in their mind. And um, they kind of go through this system in their mind about how things should fit in like puzzle pieces. So they are removed from their feelings and they're removed from their instincts and they're mostly conceptual at first, okay? And we need all three of these. We need the instinctive, the feeling, and the thinking center in us. And the point of learning about the Enneagram is not to put you in a box, but rather to get you out of a box. So we're gonna talk right now about uh, just a few points as to way to understand the Enneagram. <clears throat> there are nine life strategies on how to deal with life. Okay, life strategies. We all have nine Enneatypes inside us, but we will make an art form of one of them. And that's by nature, nurture, and free will. Nature meaning your genetics, Nurture, meaning um, how you and I were affirmed, uh, rewarded, or punished growing up. So some, some ways in which we learned how to apply defense mechanisms early on. Um, and free will. At some point, we choose the way we see the world. Okay. And because we make an art form of one of them, and yet we don't know that we are inside one paradigm, one blinder, set of blinders, we don't know that. That's where a lot of the problems are with between two people, let's say, because maybe person A will have a, a different strategy of life. They'll have a different Enneagram type. And person B and A don't understand why each other can't see reality in the same way. So if you remember the um, iceberg analogy, you may have a lot of um, conversations above the water in the conscious level. So that's the part that's above the water. And it's like, I'm consciously choosing the words that, you know, we keep arguing, keep having the same kind of argument and we're choosing these words uh, and we can't get past it. But often the issue is not above the water. The issue is actually below the water in the unconscious where the two iceberg parts are bumping up and grinding up in each other. and but because it's not recognized at the conscious level, the problem never gets solved. So what happens is the Enneagram can be kind of like a spotlight that shines light down into the water and down into the areas under the water in the unconscious that we normally don't have access to. And that's one of the great things about the Enneagram is it helps us understand our own life strategy on how to view life, but also um, ways that we become compulsive and just keep repeating more strongly these um, attributes. So you can think above it. I mean, have you ever seen, uh, I, you know, like, let's say I lived in Mexico, for example, and sometimes you'll see tourists, American tourists down there who go to Mexico and they'll ask um, something in English. They'll try to buy something in English and the person selling it doesn't speak English. And so what does, what does the tourist then do when the person's not understanding what often happens? They shout. Sweet. Yeah. They, move your, they, they shout. So it's this idea of like, if I speak even louder, if you can't understand me like this, maybe you'll understand me, you know, and kind of yell. Uh, it still doesn't work, but it's more intense. So, you know, and that's what happens with our Enneagram type is that, we may not be, it may, some, something may not be working for us, but because we don't know how to access other types of energy, um, we might just try to solve the problem with doubling the intensity of our compulsions. And that's why it's important to understand the Enneagram. Uh, the goal, in my opinion, is to move from the, to move to the average to healthy version of the Enneagram. So think about 
the Enneagram type as existing from very healthy or yeah, very healthy to very unhealthy. And right in the middle is average. So what we want to do is we want to learn how to live within the average to healthy version of our Enneagram type. Um, and oftentimes when we're stressed or um, yeah, lots of different reasons, we'll move from the we'll move into the average to unhealthy type. And if we're trying to solve problems that are important in our life and we're at the average to unhealthy levels, then we won't be able to get through those problems at a satisfactory way. It's to get us out of our boxes, as I said, and ultimately the goal is to help us empathize with others and help ourselves and others embody our anchored selves. Okay, that's why we talked about the anchored self last time. So this time we can kind of see from an Enneagram standpoint what that anchored self might be for each type. All right. And the way this is going to be set up is that the, we have the floating self here, and I'm going to list the unhealthy version of each type, with, uh, followed by like the compulsion or the vice. Um, and these little winds, these gusts that I have here at the floating self level, I, I see them as like the winds of emotion of the day. Today I'm great. Tomorrow I stink. This moment I rocked it. The very next moment someone said something to me and now I'm horrible. <laughs> and so you can kind of think of the floating self as like a balloon that just gets battered back and forth from the thoughts of, a, of the day. Uh, whereas the float, the anchored self, I'm sorry, maybe I said the floating self. Or the, I meant the floating self here gets battered like the uh, balloon. The anchored self down here uh, is where we have healthy levels. The, it's a freedom, a freedom to be connected, a freedom to live out the virtue of the Enneagram type. And uh, I'm on this side over here to the left of the image, I will be using descriptors that will lay out some tips that we can use to embody our anchored self more and more. Okay, so that's kind of how I want to um, frame each type. As I said, we have all nine types in us. So um, that's important to understand. The one is the part of you that holds high values and sees what is ideal. It's also the part of you that is haunted by resentment. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the ones. Their uh, title is reformer or perfectionist. And at their floating self level, they are often angry, um, resentful, rigid, uncompromising. Those are different terms that can express the one. Um, and maybe you've known people like that where they, they often don't smile very much. Um, they don't understand jokes very much. <laughs> and that is because they were raised early on. They, they understood that their belonging system um, was always affirmed if they were the good little boy or girl. And in a sense of um, <clears throat> good little boy or girl in the sense of morals and what is in ethics and what is right and wrong. Okay. And um, they typically are type A personalities. When you're with them, you, you do pick up a sense that they're judging you. You feel judged by them or criti they're critical of you. Uh, you and at the unhealthy levels nothing satisfies a one nothing is good enough for a one um, but you have to understand as much as they critique other people they're always super hypercritical about themselves because they have a sense of what reality should be and because it doesn't match that uh, since reality doesn't match their ideal, they are 
almost all the time resentful. Uh, there's a sense of angst or, or, or anger, but anger is not something that they are allowing themselves to express because they view anger as belonging to the bad thing. You know, it's bad to be angry. So it comes out as critical voices or judgment, that kind of thing. And <clears throat> some of the practices that can help a one move down into that anchored self would be to learn to relax, to realize that people change at different paces. And if they are a leader, they can become a servant leader and ask them, you know, ask the person what they need. Because ones will often be pretty quick to tell people what to do because they really do believe they know what to do <laughs> first and foremost. Uh, but ones can be wonderful leaders when they empower other people to make, to learn how to internalize a sense of values and ethics. Uh, and they, question. yeah. Um, what, what's kind of like the meaning of uncompromising? Um, uncompromising means uh, not able to negotiate, uh, to negotiate or see different viewpoints and allow and tolerate different viewpoints or tolerate different ways that other people can do things. Yeah. <clears throat> um, like my way or the highway? <laughs> yes, it's, it's often my way or the highway, especially if it's related to, if, especially if it's related to ethics and what is right and wrong. Yeah. You'll find ones being um, often very, very drawn to religion that is, can be severe some severe, you know, having God as being a kind of a wrathful God um, and, and having a, a theology that that really does belong into the realm of meritocracy, um, earning your way in by being good, that kind of thing. Now, we're all we all have ones. Remember, but if you are a one or if anybody listening to this is a one, we can ask ourselves, does self-criticism help me feel peace and belonging? How is that little voice of criticism working for me? <laughs> um, and we are often not, if we're ones, we're not in touch with our, our feelings. We're just running on instinct. So we need to try to ask what we're actually feeling be below the anger and wrath. And usually it's some level of grief some level of sadness that we need to mourn. The more grief and sadness we might feel if we're a one, the more compulsive in our re resentment and anger we will be. <clears throat> and then um, when we are angry at others, we need to realize that first we are angry at ourselves. So if we can, if you're a one, hang on to that, those tips and that can help you get into your anchored self which at the one level um, is serene and conscientious and principled. So these people are, are, are serene. They can let their hair down. They're grace-filled. But at the same time, they are principled people, and you can count on them to do the right thing. Okay? Um, we're going to move to the two. <laughs> And two, the two is the part of you that loves. It's also the part of you that is needy and manipulative. So twos are, they belong to the heart group, if you recall. Twos, threes, and fours are the feelings, the feelings center. And the type two, um, we have a helper, healer, and giver. Those are the titles that different teachers use. Helper, healer, and giver. The twos early on learned that they their worth and their belonging was affirmed when they were helpful, when they saw the needs that mommy or daddy had and they said, mommy, can I help you? Daddy, can I help you? What can I do um, to go serve others? And that's not a bad thing. None of these are bad things. But often what happens is the two... Uh, 
learns that it's not good for them to have needs. They lose contact of what their own needs are and they try to get other people's needs met. And <clears throat> because they're not aware that a lot of their giving, even though they might feel it's unconditional, is indeed quite conditional. And, uh, and it's quite conditional because it's where I want to earn you to like me, you to love me, uh, for me to belong to you, for me to fit in with you. I have to earn it by giving to you. Now, I would never admit this because I'm not aware of it if I'm a two. Um, but the way that can kind of look like from the compulsive standpoint in the floating self is that it is a sense of pride of it's an over as pride is an overestimation of my importance in your life. The two is it's an overestimation of my importance in your life. So in other words, if if I wasn't doing what I'm doing in your life, if I if I if you didn't have me, your life would stink. <laughs> it's kind of like that. And it's an attitude that twos will often have. And twos can be very manipulative. Um because they know what other people's needs are and they can kind of dangle them out there that if you do this, then, then I'll do that. Uh, and twos can also be very smothering because at the, the heart of a two, they often feel like there's a void there and they're worried that they don't belong anywhere. And so when someone is, when they become attached to someone, let's say a, a romantic partner, they can become attached and then they can become <clears throat> um, smothering and any sign of the other person kind of moving away a little bit, like I need some freedom, can cause the two to feel uh, abandonment, can kind of pull that abandonment thread and, and feel really badly about it. So what twos have to do is to get into their anchored self is to learn that it is not selfish to meet your own needs. They don't want to be considered selfish. That was a bad thing growing up. And what we're saying here is that it is actually not in the realm of being selfish to meet your own needs, to even have needs. Yeah. Uh, and we need to find out what motivates what are my motives in helping someone? Often twos don't even know why they're helping someone. They'll say, well, they just need it. But a lot of times twos really don't need to help other people. Other people really don't, aren't asking for help. Twos will in, assert themselves at the average to unhealthy levels and, and let me just do that for you. Let me just help you uh, without giving the person, the other person, the freedom to ask for that. And then the two might feel resentful when the other person doesn't give back to them the way they give. See? So we need to ask people what they need. And uh, the other thing, too, is that twos, we need to learn to let it be. When we give to somebody, we don't need to remind people of all that we do for them. That we can just let what we give to people and how we help them, let it be for itself. And in, in without um, attachments, yeah. Twos often have a hard time spending time alone. There's a sense that if they're alone, they feel that they're they don't belong, and that's their biggest fear is that they don't belong. So they don't like to be alone. And you might see people who go from relationship to relationship to relationship, um, and they have a hard time. Uh, being by themselves because all of these hurts of uh, the emptinesses that they feel come up into their conscious level and they can't th that'll make them feel depressed so they'd rather just be around a lot of people or or at least one person but not just themselves so they have to learn to spend some time alone and they have to learn self-compassion um, to be warm to themselves the way that they're warm to other people and they have to this is very hard for two but they have to learn to recognize affection and good wishes of others towards us 
that when someone wants to give to us, that we can actually receive that. Because twos, it's very hard for us to receive things because then we feel like we're indebted to them, the other person, or we have to, no, it's my job to give to you. You can't give to me. But when we need help and someone gives us that, we often feel guilty or shameful in receiving it because we shouldn't have needs. So Are we you the two, Doug? A am I? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm, okay, because you were talking like in the, that's your group. Yeah. So. I'm trying to do that for all the types, but you, you found me out. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> twos are my, just Karen's, right? Two, twos are my people. Yeah. Two, uh, and two is Karen, yeah. Yes. You guys, have, you guys have those in common. That's what I thought. Um, but when twos get into their anchored self, they're humble. Uh, <clears throat> they're, they have a sense of emotional freedom to, to not need to save the world, to not need to be the martyr, to not need to sacrifice. We can, uh, and we do give very well, but it's not a have to. It's an I want to. And that's a very big energetic, energetic shift from motivation. And it truly is capable uh, to do the unconditional loving twos can do. Um, so I would say that we all have the two in us, but twos in, who make an art form of this particular life strategy have to learn to recognize that they have feelings and they need to identify what they're feeling, not what we suppose others are feeling. Let's see. Okay. Moving on to the threes. <clears throat> um, threes are the part of you. Three, the three is the part of you that is your vocation in the world. Your vocation is present when you are, when you are, when, when who you are, and what you do are aligned. Okay, that's how you define your vocation is present when who you are and what you do are aligned. And it's also the part of you that deceives yourself and others to look good. So image, image is important for threes. And you know, the part of us, regardless of what type you are, um, where there's an image consciousness, that's kind of the realm of the three. So the, <clears throat> the um, title of the three is Achiever, um, Ambitious, the Ambitious People, and the Doers. Threes make the mistake of uh, being human doings and not human beings. <laughs> you can think of it that way. Um, the floating self of the three is deceit. Um, and what I mean by deceit is that the three will deceive themselves in thinking they are a little better than they are. They build an image that they want to project out in the world. So other people see this image of success and they end up believing their own hype. They believe their own mask. You see, we all have masks. Three's masks are beautiful, usually, very competent in the world. And they, they then deceive themselves that they are the mask instead of the person behind the mask that wears it. Um, at their unhealthy levels, they're fundamentally untrustworthy um, because they're never in the, they're, they're not doing things in the service of authenticity or truth. They're doing things in the service of their own image and success. Um, and they can be very narcissistic. Now, threes typically are good looking. Um, you, they are the quintessential sales person. They can sell things. Um, <clears throat> this is not a knock on this particular occupation, but I've never met a drug rep that wasn't a three. You know, the drug reps that go and they, they sell medicines to hospitals and they're always, they're always good looking. They're always dressed extraordinarily elegantly. And, um, yeah, you want to buy whatever they're selling. Cause you kind of buy the person you, you buy the image and then what they're selling, 
you, that's just secondary, you see. And they're really good at selling themselves. Um, <clears throat> threes have to learn that real success means being honest and that success in the outer world or confidence in the external world doesn't define them. It's okay if they're good at it. It's okay to make money. It's okay to, to, um, to move mountains as it were, but it doesn't define who you are. Your worth doesn't come from that. And a lot of threes make that mistake. And so um, another important thing to do for threes is to get out of your way and connect with some someone you care about. Threes have a hard time remembering to not see people as tools to advance themselves on, but when they can remember, if there's a ladder in life and I'm on the top of the ladder, uh, I have to remember all the people that are the rungs that help me get to this top. Uh, and then they've also got to remember people who are truly anchors for them. And it's always very helpful for threes to get into their anchored self by connecting authentically with people they really care about. When was the last time you, you reached out to your mom or dad or brother or sister or friend and said, hey, just want to say I love you. I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I just want to say I'm here for you. Um, thank you for being in my life. And then <clears throat> threes need to learn to take breaks. They're the, they move around more than anybody else often, uh, run circles around everybody else, but they really do need to, they're exhausted and they don't know it, so they need to take breaks. Um, it's also important for threes to ask, who is that person behind the mask? That I project or is that projected upon me because a lot of times threes get pe other people project images upon the three and the three doesn't even know that or they try to live into the the hype that other people have for them and and uh, they they start to mistake who they are for the person that other people are projecting upon them so threes have to say, who is that person behind a mask? Yeah. Uh, and they and then they need to learn the power of saying yes and yes and. And what I mean by that is yes and yes, I'll do that and I'll not be able to do that other thing. Yes, I can be there and I'm going to have to leave early. Yes, I can. You can put my name on this, and no, I'm not going to be giving a talk, <laughs> or something like that. You know, t t threes have to learn the power of, of the yes and. <clears throat> and then, lastly, um, threes can learn about the two halves of life, because there there are such things as the two halves of life, and th we don't have time to go into that. That's a whole different talk, but. This idea of the first half of life is build, 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 succeed, and then the ha second half of life is then to give away your identity, to slowly move in a position where you're giving away your gifts, giving away empowering others. Um, and if threes don't learn about the two halves of life, they'll just end up repeating the first half of life during the time of their second half of life. So that's why you, you might meet some, I'm just making this up, but some really successful person that's, you know, 70, 60 or 70 years old, and they're trying to fit into a younger crowd. And when you talk to them, you just, you don't get a sense of wisdom or hard won uh, eldership. They're not elders. They might be elderly, but they're not elders, if you will. Do you feel that difference? You wouldn't go to them for any depth. Um, on the other hand, a three that has learned that they, they've learned the mask, the person behind the mask really well, when they've learned that and they see the brokenness there and embrace that and the wholeness as well, when they see both, then they're really rooted and honest and they know that they can use the mask and all of the floating self stuff to do good in the world, but it is not who they are. And they're really, really helpful then to help um, bring out the honesty in other people because they know that their floating self is constantly trying to 
decorate itself to make it look make it make themselves look really good. Okay, um, <clears throat> I can already tell. I'm going to continue to the four. I can already tell that we're going to not be able to fit this in in one hour. So at eleven o'clock, I will ask people if they need to jump off right away. Um, or we can go for a little bit longer or that we can do a little continuation next time. So I just, I don't want to jip a number though. <clears throat> Type four, still in the, the heart area, the feeling center. And the four is the part of you that sees beauty in all things. It's also the part of you that is green with envy. I'm not sure. Um, if you've heard that term before, green with envy, but it's this sense of being envious, um, envidia, you know, envidia, envidia in, in Espanol, envious of other people and jealous of them in some ways, okay? Uh, and we'll talk why, why that's the case, but we all have the four in us, but some fours, and you can usually spot them, make an art form of being their title and their title is the individualist, the bohemian, the aristocrat, the artiste, the artist, the romantic. Fours are deep feeling people. Um, very, very deep feeling people and fours um, always live life <clears throat> at the depths and so where most people are living life here kind of floating around superficial from the forest point of view the four is way down here and <clears throat> they it's an interesting temp tension fours have because on one hand fours pride themselves on being a little elite like at least i'm not like those superficial sheeple you know the sheep that are people that are just doing life without any self-examination or analysis. They, they don't see the beauty of life the way I do. They're just mundane people. Uh, they like that they're deep people, that they've got they're working on life and trying to understand life. They like that about themselves. And they're secretly envious that other people seem to have a much easier life than they do. It's like this weird tension because fours do have a difficult emotional life until they can learn balance, but it takes a really long time for fours. <clears throat> fours have uh, a tendency to be self-absorbed, um, always sort of self-centered. Uh, they can have an avoidant personality where they don't really, they aren't really around people. They don't want to be around people too much because uh, they want to exist in their depth all the time. And they could be very depressive. They, they often see themselves as fundamentally inadequate in a sense, or they see themselves as um, a real gem, beautiful diamonds, but that this world doesn't deserve them. And because they're not engaging with the world as much, then uh, they can be depressed because that's what happens when we force ourselves to become islands, let's say. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times artists are fours. Uh, the hopeless romantic, It's I see this a lot where a four will have a favorite person. They'll choose a person, become a favorite best friend, or, you know, like, wow, you, you complete me kind of thing whether it's a friend or a romantic partner. And then that friend will let them down some way because nobody can live up to the projected ideal of four. The four projects their ideals upon somebody else. And no one can live up to that. So when, they, when that person falls off the pedestal that the four has put them on, then the four gets bored or, or gets disappointed, um, starts to figure out ways to not be around them. And then that person might say, well, I'm not going to be your friend anymore, or, or I'm breaking up with you. In which case that leaves the four in panic of like, oh my gosh, I've done it once again. Um, I've, I'm all alone. 
in this world again. And so then they start to idealize the person that just broke up with them, either friendship or romantically. So you can see that the four is often trapped in this um, sea of emotionality. And they have to realize fours to move into their anchored self that their feelings are not a true source of support for them. They, 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 fours will overestimate the importance of their feelings. For them, feelings are real, as opposed to reality being what it is, and feelings are information for us to understand reality, but they're just one ingredient, one tool, they're just one tool in a box of things that we can use to understand reality. Fours need to avoid putting things off until they are in the right mood. Sometimes fours will never do things like they have to pay taxes or all the mundane things that others have to do because they're just not in the right mood and I'll do it when it's right for me. And what we're saying here is that fours need to learn how to be a little bit more um, effective in the outer world, competent in the external. Fours need to realize that they will never be put together enough to engage in the world. You'll never be perfect. You'll never be, it'll never be the right time for you to engage. So you might as well just do it now. Like fours need to learn to exist in the gray and not the perfection that they want to be in the world. Um, they also need to learn to develop a wholesome self-discipline. So fours are typically are not disciplined in their uh, mind as in terms of uh, logic or repeating rituals or doing something that requires them to do it over and over and over again. They want freshness and depth all the time. But for fours to move into their anchored self, it's important to have a wholesome self-discipline. So. Uh, a commitment to prayer um, at the same time, same kind of way for a while, or a commitment to exercise, whether you want to or not. You, you commit to a kind of practice and do it, or a commitment to do better in your job because, yeah, your job is boring and they don't pay you enough and they don't re recognize just how amazing you are. That all might be true, but be committed to the job for your own integrity kind of thing. Um, they also need to avoid lengthy conversations with, in their imagination. Fours will let their script of how uh, imaginations just go, and they'll have a script or a narrative of these conversations that um, never took place, yet they'll might, they might spend a, day, a full day on it, or more than one day, playing out these imaginary things and what they're saying, what I'm saying. Uh, they also can learn self-compassion and they can see beauty that is always and everywhere present. Fours don't have to see beauty always at the depth. They can learn to see that the external world or the mundane world is beautiful. And in fact, the mundane world is, is a portal, if we're looking at it, a portal to get into the depth. Um, so there's the here, and the depth of here. And fours are always at the depth of here, but they can learn to be in the here too, see? And when fours move into their their anchored self, um, they, ha they can exhibit this thing called equanimity. And equanimity means um, even soldness, uh, a, a super balanced, super okay with just who they are and all their limitations. And they know that they really are deep and beautiful in a diamond. And they also know that you are too. And maybe you don't know it yet, but fours will use their gifts to help bring out that depth in you. Not from a place of envy or wrath or trying to control you, but in a place of empowerment, true empowerment. They, they renew themselves. Their energy gets renewed from... They don't need outside sources to renew their energy. They can renew themselves and they learn how to engage in the outer world really well.
Okay. The more you learn about the Enneagram, the more you can meet people where they're at and use a set of language, not in the idea of manipulating them, but an idea of meeting where they're at and understanding their worldview. Let's see, that, that, that's a kind of servant leadership that the Enneagram can help us with when we are in a position of um, being sought after or like an authority. Yeah. The type five. So just to recap, uh, one thing here that I think would be important to keep in mind is that we are talking about three different um, centers. We have the instinctual center, which is eight, nine and one. These are people who process reality first and foremost uh, through their instincts or gut feel. Um, and they, they come up with an immediate first impression. Boom. Uh, they are the most black and white of all of the, the thinkers, all, all of the different types. Then we move into the heart center, and that is the twos, threes, and fours. And twos, threes, and fours, they process the reality first and foremost through the energy center of the heart, through feelings, through emotions. Um, they often do not process reality in black and white ways. It can be almost the opposite where they never get to a decision sometimes um, because they're processing so many feelings. And usually it's not their own feelings. They're, they're on a search for their own feelings, but they're processing other people's thoughts or feelings. Then the fives, sixes, and sevens are the head type, and they encounter reality through their thoughts, um, belief structures, belief systems, that kind of thing, first and foremost. And they tend to be more removed from their feelings or in instincts. And so we have to help them uh, get in touch with their own feelings and their own instincts. And so, uh, yeah, we'll just move right into there because the, the type five is the first type of the head type. Okay. So <clears throat> also remember that we have all of the types inside us. We just tend to make an art form of one of them. And the type five is the part of you that is wise and discerning. It's also the part of you that is aloof and out of touch. Aloof and out of touch. Okay. So what we have here is <clears throat> the type five is often called the investigator, the quiet specialist, or the observer. And uh, when I think investigator is a really good word because they do tend to investigate things. Think of Sherlock Holmes as kind of an archetype of the type five. Details are very, very important. They love details. They love knowing knowledge. Knowledge for fives is just, uh, it, it's such an exciting experience to, to go into a library where you just have books all around you and you're all alone is is so thrilling for fives. The, the floating self style of a five, in other words, the compulsive style or the unintegrated style, that is their big vice, if you will, is greed. And it's not greed in terms of money or material wealth. Um, they could almost care less about that stuff. Uh, it's actually greed for knowledge and details. And I've talked to a few fives. They'll ask questions about you. They want to know questions about you or what you're going to talk about. Uh, and one question will lead to another question will lead to another question. They don't give a sense, though, of how they're processing what you're saying. And, and sometimes, or often rather, what fives will say in response to something that you might have said would be, well, that's interesting or interesting. <laughs> um, because interesting, it is interesting for them, but it's a non-committal word. It doesn't actually 
say to the other person what they're really thinking about. So it's a non-committal word, but they do process things and things can be intriguing to them. But they don't, it's greed because they don't often share their own ways of thinking, their own feelings, their own positions on stuff. Because knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. And they don't want to give other people power over them. They can be stingy. They can be aloof. In other words, uh, not really attached to the rest of the people. If they're teachers, professors are oftentimes fives. They can be talking and talking and talking, but there's no emotional connection. You don't feel an emotional connection uh, from them. They're kind of uh, up in the, their heads. They're floating heads. <laughs> they can have avoidant personalities where they just seem uh, like scientists wherever they go. Archetypally, they're, they're kind of the nerds in the class. They sit in the back, they observe, but they don't engage. On the other hand, when they do engage and they do trust that the other person is ready to listen to them, then they feel like they have a captive audience and they can just like talk, 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 almost diary of the mouth. <laughs> and uh, because they may lack some social cues, they're not really good at telling social cues or body language of other people because they're not connected that way, then they may not be able to read a room very well at all. And they talk and talk, not realizing that nobody is really wanting to listen. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, the anchored self type five, going down, 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 the anchored self type five is someone who can both engage reality and be non-attached at the same time. So that means they put their knowledge into real world applications and they're not emotionally attached. So it's kind of like, well, if it works, cool. If it doesn't work, oh well, but I'm not gonna take it personally. Um, they can be very engaged, very hands-on, wanting to, wanting to have something work in, ap be applicable in real world but at the same time, there is a refreshing ego in egolessness about them. At their anchored self level, they can be warm. They can be they can they know how to express some sense of warmth. Uh, they're open minded, you know, very, very floating self fives are extraordinarily closed minded, but open minded anchored self fives are open-minded they're willing to let their let new ideas new thoughts come in and they're not scared by new ways of thinking or new paradigms and they are able to see holistically okay now if one way to get into your anchored self of a type five is to realize we often place replace direct experience with concepts. So instead of uh, actually experiencing life, they'll re they won't experience life much, much as much as just have concepts about things, how theoretically this would work, or theoretically I would do this, but they don't actually do it. Um, the other thing about type fives is it's okay to not know. Get used to the unknowing nature of mystery. Notice when you're thinking and speculating takes you out of immediate experience. So type fives need to be in, integrated in the immediate experience of the now, of the immediacy of the moment. And notice when you're thinking, if you're a type five, takes you away from that. So always try to bring it back and be here now. Type fives can get hands on with something that's good. We need to, if you're a type five, to trust people Trusting people can bring deep fulfillment to learn how to trust others, not just ideas or concepts or what they can bring in terms of their uh, knowledge, but trusting people at the heart level can make fives feel warm. 
to learn to recognize other people's body language. That can be a tip. To develop awareness about social cues. So if you're a type five and that doesn't come naturally, take it on as a scientist and go observe those humans and then imitate them. And let people know you care for them. Use words. Say things like, I love you. Really thankful for your presence in my life. Uh, that can be a way that type fives integrate their feelings and heart. Okay, type six. Type sixes are, they tend to be the most common of all of the types in the world. Type six is the part of you that is loyal. It's also the part of you that has general anxiety disorder. <laughs> type sixes oh are by nature the most fear-based. All of the head types are what you call fear-based. So they, they move into their head because reality is kind of scary and they do it differently. Type fives will do it with ideas. Type sixes are the most fear-based and they tend to be uh, the most needing clarity and, and look for stability. And they'll look for stability through a person. And emo I'm talking about emotional or existential stability. So who am I and what is my purpose? Um, and how am I going to feel calm amidst the storm of going around? Those are the questions that are constantly inside a type six's mind. They're constantly thinking about this, whether they're conscious of it or not. And so they will seek people or ideologies or belief systems or institutions that for them will give them the best chance of emotional and existential stability. Their title is the loyalist or the devil's advocate. So doubting uh even as they're loyal they they want to they want to like well what if we do this or if you do that what you're saying i'm just worried that this is going to happen they're always thinking about the future and what's going to go wrong so for example you know how a weather person is uh trying to prognosticate the weather trying to give you a weather prognosis, well, tomorrow's going to rain and then we'll have three days of wind and so on and so forth. So type sixes are doing this in the future uh, psychologically. So they're always trying to go in the future and find out what's going to go wrong because they're sure, they're 100% sure it's going to be bad. And then they, the problem is, is they live in the present moment always in their head in the future about what's going to go wrong. And that's why they have general anxiety disorder, because it's there's always a sense of dread and doom on the edge of chaos. And that's why they're attracted to very strong leaders. They're attracted to strong, often fundamentalist ideas, not just religious ideas, but other ideas. Fanaticism is what they can be prone to at the floating self level. So they can have a lot of fear. Um, they can have cowardice. So, so literally be cowards. Now we're all this way, but just type sixes make an art form of it. They usually have high anxiety at the floating self level. They can be very paranoid. And again, as I said, they can be prone to fanaticism um, where it is, uh, you know, mob mobs and lynching and those kinds of things of, of ideas or people that they feel are directly threatening their stability. Okay. The um, way down into their anchored self, there's a couple of tips if we're type six. So if you are present here and now, then your anxiety can be energizing to get things done. You see, just let me give an, um, an insert something about all the types here. I've come to teach and come to learn that stress is not a problem. So I want us to see stress from a scale of 1 to 10. 
a, a spectrum from one to 10. So we're gonna say stress from one to five. Stress is actually energizing. It gets us up in the morning. We have to get things done and we can feel a, feel a sense of excitement, of adrenaline, you know? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We, we should have a little stress, but from five to 10 on the spectrum of stress, that can be anxiety. So you can have stress, but do you have to have anxiety? That's the question. So a lot of times people will approach something, and this is true for all the types, especially type six, they'll approach their life or things that happen in their life upon the spectrum of stress, they'll approach it at an eight out of 10. When really the situation, if you look at it factually, really only requires maybe a two or three not an eight. It's not that doom or gloom. So you can back it down through different techniques to about two or three, feel the energy of the stress. That's fine. Get you things done, but you don't have to have the intensity of the anxiety. So that's just something I want to throw in there because that's true for all of us. For sixes, learning to trust yourself and external authority at the same time. Often they do not trust themselves. They project their power onto authority and trust the authority too much. So you have to learn how to trust yourself. So an example often is given is the tricycle. If you think of a tricycle, think of uh, the big wheel that you're going on, that you're actually powering. All of us are thinking of adults now in tricycles, that's fun. Uh, now the big wheel is experience. I want you to think of that as your experience. It's the big wheel and that's the important one. Trust your experience. Then you can say the back two wheels, let, I'm just saying if you're a Christian here, one way to understand this is the first wheel is the experience and the back two wheels can be scripture and tradition. You know, scripture and then the tradition from which the scripture is interpreted or your church. It's not that we don't trust those things. They're important. You can't just go on experience alone. That you're narcissistic. We have we do trust our ancestors. We trust the body of wisdom and knowledge that is coming from uh, our our big concentric circles of our life, our family of origin and belief systems and all of that. We can trust those, but not over experience. You see, so that's just one way to think about it. Others very likely think better of you than you realize. Your fears tell you more about your attitudes towards others. So often sixes don't feel that others think much of them. You know, they always think others uh, downplay them. But sixes need to think, well, other people actually like me more than I think they do. And if I have fears about, um, if I have fears, often that is a more telling about my attitude towards others. I'm not <laughs> trusting them. <clears throat> Sixes, when you are anxious or stressed, keep your opinion, keeping your opinions to yourself helps your relationships. <laughs> because oftentimes when sixes are stressed, they will feel a compulsion to be the person in there that's saying, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, oh my God, and you're doing it wrong, and you're doing it wrong. Uh, if you're a six, become, start to really learn about your internal world, feel the red flags of anxiety coming up, and just because you feel them doesn't mean you need to share them, your opinions to other people about their decisions. Even though you may think you're doing a favor to other people, you're actually um, often going to be coming across as very judgmental. So just to give you a, a silly example on that, um, when, my, uh, when my wife and I found out that she was pregnant with our third kid, you know, we made the rounds and we told people. And I called my mom, who was a type six, I mean, just super, super sexy. <laughs> and when I called her, this is very typical of my mom. Um, I told her, you know, we're going to have another child and we're very excited before congratulations, before anything else, there was a, a pause. And then she's like, Oh, 
well, what, what are you going to do when you go to a restaurant now? Because, well, now you can't just get a table for four. And that can be weird because there's not a lot of tables for, you know, five or six. And because <laughs> so, we already had two other kids. <clears throat> you know, it, it, of course, she was very happy that we were having another kid. But her first thought was all of the fears and problems that having an odd number of children would bring. That that's to give you an example. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. So six is watch your tendency to project onto other people your own fears and or displace. So if, if you're anxious about your job, don't come home and be naturally anxious about everybody else. Or if you're anxious about something you can't control, don't come home and displace that anxiety on the rest of the world. So that's just something that we all can look at. But six is, if you're a six, then that is something that's specifically challenging for you. But on the anchored si anchor self level, sixes are very courageous, very courageous, they're very interdependent. Uh, they choose to be dependent, but it's their choice. It's not a have to, it's not a codependency. They can be very trustworthy, very grounded, and reliable. Sixes can be the most uh, courageous of all of the types because they're constantly battling their anxiety. Moving on to sevens. Sevens is the last type of the head type. Uh, the seven is the part of you that is joyful, and smiley, uh, amped up on coffee. It's also the part of you that is never satisfied. So everybody think of a mountaintop. The seven is up on the mountaintop and you know, arms in the victory, arms up in the air. And it's, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And look at the infinite horizons all around, infinite everywhere. That is the place where sevens want to live their whole life. Infinite opportunities, infinite horizons, huge visionary people, uh, high on life kind of stuff. But they never want to come down from that mountain and actually do the work. That's often what you find at the floating self level. So sevens are the enthusiasts, the adventurers, the visionaries. Uh, their floating self level is gluttony. And gluttony, not in so much as just food, 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 you know, because usually we associate the word gluttony with like gluttonous food taking intake, but rather it's a gluttony for life itself, for ex for adventure. And because they're kind of the bee that goes to flower from flower to flower to flower to flower, at the floating self level, they can seem very shallow. They're not shallow, but they can seem shallow to everyone else and they may not have gone down inside themselves. So they may not even be understanding of their own depth. They can be very restless. N no vacation is enough. And even when they're on the shores of the most beautiful beach, wherever, because they planned that vacation, even on that place, they're thinking about the next vacation because this one is not quite as satisfying as that next thing that's going to happen. Um, they can have a histrionic personality disorder. So it's kind of the, oh, my God, and everything is so dramatic and it just... Their words can be almost so flowery and exuberant um, where they become the center of attention and they don't know how not to be in the center of attention. And people will put them there because they're kind of fun. You know, they're fun, they're life of the party, but in a sense, they can suck the oxygen out of the room. They can almost feel bipolar in terms of having seen these manic episodes of strong adventure, but then they go on this adventure and nothing satisfies them because their actual search for depth, they do that in the external world. They're trying to satisfy what, what they really need to do is to go down and in and find their own depth. But um, the problem with six, sevens is that they, wherever they go, I listened to the sentence, Wherever they go, there they are. In other words, they could go to the greatest beaches in the world and they can't escape themselves. They could go to whatever adventure, take whatever course, 
and they can't escape themselves. So they're always searching for the keys to go on the inside. And so let's talk about the, the tips to get into your anchored self if you're a seven. To recognize your impulsiveness, let most of your impulses pass. So just because you have an impulse doesn't mean you have to do it. Because oftentimes it's just your wanting to be on the mountaintop, but you got to stay down on the, on the ground for a while and, and finish your last task. Learn to really listen to others. Instead of sevens don't really listen often, they're always thinking about how they um, want to check out from a conversation because they've got more important visionary things going on up here and they're not present. Realize you do not have to have everything this very moment. So think of a child who has to have everything right now. Sevens kind of externalize this childlike thing um, in life and they want everything right now. So prudence is good, temperance is good. Preference, they need to preference quality over quantity. Often sevens make the mistake of having too much without much quality. So make a preference of quality over quantity. Sevens, become friends with your shadow, like fear, anxiety, early trauma, including abuse. Sevens are actually often running away from the skeletons in their closet. Um, and often sevens will have had trauma in their early life and they spend an entire lifetime running away from that. Become friends with the shadows of others. Sevens will often um, only want to talk about optimistic and joyful things from other people, not interested in the problems of other people. Because then that would invoke their own problems. <laughs> and then lastly, sevens learn to commit to something and someone. So it's uh, sevens will often have a hard time committing in relationships or committing to a job and staying there because it requires the uncomfortableness of boredom or, or tediousness or mundane activity. The word boredom is the scariest word for a seven. Ooh, I don't want to be trapped. But committing to something and, and growing roots is the salvation for sevens. And when they can get into their anchored self, we're talking about a sober joy, a joy that is after the cross, not before the cross. Sevens want to spend their whole life in, in, a, in the resurrection state um, where they can do everything, uh, be everything, but they don't want to go through the cross that's necessary, the crucifixion of their own shadow self going into that. They don't want that cross. Uh, they want to do a nonstop flight over the cross and into resurrection. And the only way to get to resurrection is, as we've talked about before, is through the crucifixion. But when they do that, then they have a groundedness. Um, they're going to be optimistic, but it's a realistic optimism. They're going to understand ecstasy and agony at the same time. They're going to be flexible and playful. So they're going to have all of the childlike qualities that we love about sevens with very little of the childish superficiality and narcissism type eights <clears throat> okay we're moving into the instinct part type eights are the are the types that we all love to hate and they kind of love that they're hated <laughs> it's the it is a very strange um thing eights are are very, very, very powerful people, and they love conflict. I'll just say that. Okay, the eight is the part of you that actively expresses being. It's also the part of you that is all or nothing. It's the warrior part of you. All or nothing, my way or the highway. It's got to be this, can't be that. The challenger, their title is the challenger or active controller or the boss, um, and they, the godfather, the godmother kind of thing, you know? Their vice is lust, and it's not 
uh, necessarily lust in terms of like sexual lust, but it's a lust for possession of objects in the service of increasing their power and dominance. So it's a lust after power. It's a lust after position. It's a lust after privilege because they want to be the king or the queen and they want to have subjects and they want, they want to install their way of doing things. Uh, and in their floating self, they can be very vengeful wanting if they get hurt or feel like they were slighted in any way, they will come back for revenge. They can have cruel authoritarianism, uh, cruel. And they also, they all, they always at the floating self level, seven or eights always, always become alienated because no one can deal with them unless they may pay people to actually be around them, but nobody can't stand them. Okay. The eights are the dictators of families or the dictators of countries at the floating self level. They create what's called closed systems. Closed systems means that they are the head, the rules are their rules, and they don't allow any uh, anybody to challenge their rules from the inside of their system, and they sure as heck don't allow anybody to challenge the rules from the outside. Um, so they will go on the attack. But the eight at the deep level, the anchored self level, are the most incredible leaders you can imagine. They are leaders that get things done. They're the Martin Luther Kings of the world. Um, they are Mother Teresa's of the world. She's, she was an eight. They are people who come in, challenge the systems that are, can get rid of the system if they need to, and empower other people to empower the people to do their best in the world is the greatest compliment a healthy eight can feel. <clears throat> they can be very truthful at the anchored self. At the floating self, they lie. They're full of BS, just constant BS. Uh, and they really believe it. And even they, if they don't believe it, they're going to beat you down to make sure you believe it. But at the anchored self level, they know that they're BS artists <laughs> and they they won't do that. They're, they're almost exactly the opposite. They want to show all their cards, all of their, their all of their shadow. They just want you to see it because they want you to see that they're full of crap, um, but they'll be here 150 percent. They are the most intense of all the types. They're very pastoral at the anchored self level. So how do you get into the anchored self if you're an eight? <clears throat> Your real power is inspiring and uplifting others, not dominating them, not manipulating them. Learning to really listen to others will actually empower you in the long run. Eights will be listening, will have a conversation, but they're thinking about how you're wrong already, and then they'll cut you off uh, and then show you how you're wrong and if you don't agree with them they're still going to win so they'll come back at you and attack you by your personhood so they'll say well people like you would think that way they'll do something they'll, they'll hit you in the jugular because they'll know something about you and then they'll take you down just because they have to win the argument you know they at the the floating self level eights never ever 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 apologize at the anchored self level, they're the quickest to apologize. Many people look up to you if you're an eight, so be mindful of what kind of leadership you are displaying with your energy and behavior. They're natural leaders. All eights are natural leaders, so they have to be mindful of that. Eights, remember that people won't remember what you said as much as you made them feel. That's the very important thing for eights to remember. And lastly, and probably most importantly, learning how to be vulnerable is your price to pay for the life you want to create for yourself and others.
Eights are the quintessential bullies at the floating self level. But all bullies have a very, very insecure part of them inside. They don't want anybody else to see. Uh, and the way they get into their anchored self is to learn actually how to be vulnerable to others and to themselves. And when they can, then they will accept your weaknesses and be and then try to empower you. They can be the greatest of leaders when they're in their vulnerability of themselves. And then lastly, because we started with one, so now we're going to finish with nine. The nine is the part of you that resides in the stillness of being. Oh, <laughs> it's also the part of you that disappears. Okay, so nines are very, very connected to the silence of being, stillness. Think of somebody who doesn't have to do much. Uh, they're just, they just are. They're much more human beings, not human doings. Like type threes are human doings. Number nines are type, are human beings. But the problem is, is that if they aren't into their anchored self, they're human beings with no doings. <laughs> Whereas type threes are, and their floating self are type, are human doings with no human beings. <laughs> you see, it's kind of fun. The type nine, uh, their <clears throat> title is the adaptive peacemaker. So they can adapt to situations and they can help people bring out peace, mediate their natural mediators at their, uh, that's the title. At their floating self level, their false self, their vice is sloth. Uh, sloth is the, a, a term meaning existential laziness meaning that they never fully live into their potential, nor do they care about it because, well, refreshingly, they don't have much of an ego that needs to have power. Um, they are simply okay with doing just enough to get by because why bother? In fact, you can almost picture nines as being their, their life statement is why stand when you can sit and why sit when you can lay down in life? <laughs> they tend to not be uh, naturally ambitious for themselves because they, like, what's the point? You know, they see all these people, all the rest of the types are playing their little ego games and they're just quietly in the back, just shaking their head, saying, my God, these people need to, be the best and fastest and all that stuff. And they're just back there with sitting on maybe an incredible amount of talent and treasure inside themselves. But yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage with the world. So at their floating self level, they can be passive aggressive by just not participating in a conversation or an activity. Um, they can have extreme stubbornness. I mean, eights are stubborn, but nines, I mean, it is a diamond like art uh, that they can be so stubborn the they can numb out numb out on all kinds of things just to not engage with life oftentimes nines will be um they'll they might do a lot of pot this tends to be their drug of choice because it's i just don't want to engage with life you know it's too much they can have almost a schizoid personality, which is uh, they just by themselves, closed homebodies kind of thing at their floating self level. That's that they're fine with that. And they can almost be catatonic where they just barely move, just sit for hours and hours and hours and hours uh, pro procrastinating. Procrastinating is their middle name. All right. <clears throat> Getting into their anchored self, here's some tips. So if you're a nine, examine if you go along with others just to keep the peace and be nice. Sometimes nines won't engage with a crowd or a group because they don't want to rock the boat. They just want to be peaceful, you know, that peacemaker thing. But but maybe they actually should say something. Maybe Maybe they actually do see something that nobody else sees and they should speak up. 
If you're a nine, become an active participant in the world around you, not a passive one. Be active, engage. You actually do mean something. We need your energy because it's going to bring us all down into our um, anchored selves rather than just ego floating around there. If you're a nine, recognize that you have aggressions and anxieties and feelings that you need to deal with. Nines oftentimes will be like, peace out, man. Peace. I'm just a laid back dude. But the truth is, is that inside there, they can be really anxious. They can have lots of anger and aggression and feelings, but they don't know how to access those things. So they'll just push, push them down and numb out. And, uh, Nines need to recognize that there are anxieties, there are rage, they rage, they can have rages and angers, and they need to deal with them. Nines, if you're a nine, exercise can actually help you become more aware of your body and emotions. Nines often will spend their whole life in the turtle shell, so that reality hits their turtle shell, but uh, they and they're not maybe into their bodies at all. Um, and maybe they're not into their emotions. So exercise, actually getting out there, moving your body, getting a little tone, can help a nine access body knowledge and access their emotions. Because the emotions often, our emotions often live in our body. So if you're anxious, you can probably learn where that lives in your body. Or if you're angry, where does that live in your body? That's one of the first things I actually teach people in counseling is where are your emotions living right now? Where is that right now? What you just said, how you're feeling, where is that in your body? Nines often are the most attached from that. Nines and fives. So we have to help them get connected and moving around and exercising can be good. And then lastly, if you're a nine, dealing with conflict is one of the best ways to grow. Ooh, I know you don't want to grow, nines. Ooh, I know. It means you have to get off the couch in your, of your life. But conflict, it, it's not fun, but you got to do it. And the more you do it, the more you grow. And the more you grow, the better you can be a peacemaker at a anchored self level and truly truly be an agent of peace. Make me an instrument of your peace, as uh, St. Francis' prayer goes. So at the anchored self level, nines are, my, they have mindful action. So they're going to bring a sense of mindfulness, a sense of uh, expanded view, metanoia, holistic seeing, but they're going to do it in action. So that's a beautiful combination. And then they're going to be fully present. Nines who are in their anchored self are fully present, mind, body, spirit, in the moment, with you, right now, 100%, without a need to change anything. And that, in and of itself, is unbelievably therapeutic for the people around you. Because nines at the anchored self automatically shift the energy in a room. Whereas before nine walks in, maybe there's just like anxiety and people are vying for power and, you know, the first and my idea and my idea. A nine walks in and it's like the volume of the energy of the room just kind of goes from frenzied chaos to just this settled equanimity. Uh, and nines can do that just by being physically present, physically, spiritually, emotionally present in the moment. Nines are greatly content. You know, they're minimalists at their heart. They don't need a lot of things. They're just present and joyful in the present moment. And nines can transform things. They're very transformative at their anchored self level. Incredible leaders, very transformative. But they have to learn how to engage with the world. <laughs>